pain, that medically elusive evil. What about changing the focus from controlling pain to understanding pain as more than a symptom? Can pain be cheated? My name is Dr. Dean, chiropractor and physiotherapist. My goal is to reframe how medicine understands pain to improve care. This podcast series is dedicated to a same-day conservative treatment for low back pain. This podcast has a companion published article number 27. Welcome to the Pain is Not the Only Problem podcast. Article 27. Pain is not the only problem. Lumbar degenerative disc disease article. Normally, I'm telling you uh, these articles intend to reevaluate and to meet patient expectations and restore ADLs, uh, but this is going to be a little different. I'm going to also include now for the first time some professional commentary. And I think it's important at this point because we're going to start coming around the bend into reality now. So for 26 articles, 26 podcasts or so, we've been looking at the science, the chemistry, the mechanics, the theories, a lot of the scientific support. But it gets to the point in clinical practice where you have to start doing a reality check. You can't just keep saying, the research says this, therefore we have to do this. Because honestly, in my practice, although I've looked at a lot of research, what I do for low back pain in my office usually works uh, within one visit, and it kind of doesn't matter what the symptoms are. So what I'm saying is we're talking, of course, about non-traumatic uh, back pain. We're not talking about um, automobile accidents, uh, sports, blunt force trauma, motor vehicle accidents, things like that. We're talking about the type of back pain that most folks have. With, we could even say, you know, 90% or more have, and they just want someone to be in charge of helping them get past their discomfort and their encumbrance on their lifestyle, their activities, their hobbies, their joys, their weekends with their grandkids or water skiing or, you know, of course, I'm going to throw in there tennis, but but honestly, we need to start reframing how we'd even discuss low back pain. And that's why I keep saying pain is not the only problem. There are other contributors to the patient's situation. And one of those is this dogmatic approach that clinicians have about this. And I'm not meaning any disrespect, but it's just nonsense to keep pointing your pencil eraser at the MRI at a disc bulge, especially when the bulge is pointing in any direction towards the spinal cord and proclaiming that this is the causative incident that is producing the low back pain when it just isn't. Now that's a different conversation than a nerve root imbrication or discal content protrusion that is seriously impacting nerve root function. But then I'm going to argue that in many cases, that nerve root foramen is quite large and there's kind of room for everything. And I'm going to argue there might even be room for a little bit of disc material. Okay. I've been very diligent. I have looked at hundreds of articles on this topic. And I've been arguing for years, this is not a good direction to point the patient into. This is not the diagnosis. And then we can also say at the same point, uh, not only is it not the diagnosis, but how many other contributors has the clinician uh, oversighted? And I'm going to say in a commentary way, a personal professional commentary, ignored in light of uh, maintaining their daily schedule and their uh, billability and their reimbursables and such, right? All those automatic practices that happen when things like, well, let's just say this, what are the number one and number two contributors uh, or say comorbidities for uh, chronic non-traumatic, uh, episodic, low back pain. So number one, of course, we all know is cigarette smoking. You could say c cigar smoking. What's number two? Well, of course, we all know what number two is. So bark it out. What is it? It's 
job dissatisfaction. Okay, so when the patient comes in and uh, you know the MRI is ordered immediately without any sort of orthopedic examination or you know we're going to get to it, it's coming, the report of findings, it's article, let me look, 30, sorry, it'll make more sense, right? So all of these things are missed because it's easy to just order the MRI and then damn the MRI and then that's the end of that and sign them up for a surgical consult right and that's all the just it's that is disrespecting uh, the patient's values the patient's not getting a fair shake right so let's start with the patient and not with how easy it is for the clinician to just order the MRI so I'm looking around online and um, I find nothing absolutely nothing I look in the ICD-10 codes and I see nothing. So here we have this great article. You know, I've been searching for published evidence that spine and nerve compression causing low back pain is a real thing, right? A real thing. And wow, I just found this incredible article. Okay, so it's Lumbar Degenerative Disc Disease. It's published by Stat Pearls. The authors are Charles Donnelly III, Andrew Hanna and Matthew Varacalo. Uh, my arguments against the assertion that disc herniation causes low back pain is supported by lack of evidence. These are my four pillars. Number one, neither disc herniation nor spinal compression contribute to non-traumatic low back pain. So this, we're again, we're talking about 90% or maybe more of patients. Number two, Advanced imaging is not necessary in order to provide excellent low back pain care. Number three, neither surgery nor steroids are a suitable course of care for nonspecific nor ridiculous low back pain. And number four, patient education with an activities-based course of care is the gold standard model of low back pain care. And then so I'll just throw in there a little asterisk. I'm saying, hey, you know, to the clinicians, don't forget that 80% of low back pain patients get better with six to eight weeks of conservative care or no care, right? So remember, even without us, 80% of those patients get better. Be careful, okay? So let's enjoy this article. All right, so these these are quotes, quotations taken from this article. The first one says, Slightly more than 90% of herniated discs occur at the L4, L5, or L5, S1 disc space, your author included, which will impinge on the L4, L5, or S1 nerve root. Agreed. This compression produces radiculopathy into the posterior leg and dorsal foot, sometimes. In the absence of motor deficits, a non-operative course of analgesia, so they're saying conservative care, palliative care, activity modification, and injections, I don't agree with that, should be tried for several months. Okay, so that's sort of our landing comment. Okay, let's let's hear more. Most intervertebral disc degenerations are asymptomatic, making a true understanding of the prevalence difficult. Additionally, due to lack of uniformity in the definitions of disc degenerations and disc herniations, the actual prevalence of the disease is difficult to review across multiple studies. The study supports that the mere incidental finding of disc disease is common and should not necessitate specialist evaluation in the absence of pain or limitations. Okay, so I've been saying this over and over and over. Just because you see it on the picture doesn't mean it is the damning, single, unifying evidence for the back pain. It may be a contributor, right? And then in many of these previous podcasts, we've talked about all of the others. And I've I have found at least 126 organic and lifestyle contributors to low back pain, and that does not include disc herniation. Okay, let's hear more. The radiation of back pain associated with disc disease is thought to be due to the compression of the nerve roots in the spinal canal from either one or a combination of the following elements. However, herniated nucleus pulposus HNP 
material predictably is resorbed over time, with the sequestrated fragment demonstrating the highest degree of resorption potential. In general, 90% of patients will have a symptomatic improvement in radicular symptoms within three months following non-operative protocols alone. And so I've been saying this also, it's not degeneration. The spine is not breaking down. It is restructuring itself so that the spine can continue to do its job as commanded by the lifestyle of the patient, whether advantageous or destructive, right? So in my case, my discs well, kind of don't exist. My my lumbar spine pretty much just looks like a bunch of hamburger. And the the spine bones themselves are so flat and spread out. It's like you make a cheese sandwich and you put that metal thing on the top and it kind of like smashes it down. Make it, that's what my, <laughs> my vertebral bodies look like in my lumbar spine. But it needed to do that. Because my spine's jobs have changed so many times. And I'm, you know, I work my body, my spine. I demand a lot of it. So it is changing its shape. And it isn't, you know, of course, what it looked like when it was 17 or 27. But by the time I was 32, it had pretty much taken on the look that it has today. And so be it. I have no limitations in my ranges of motion. And I'm not upset that it looks the way it looks. It's just nature. And it's nature doing its job. Let's say you plant a tree on a hill. And over time, some of that hill starts to erode. Well, the roots aren't going to grow down anymore. They're going to grow sideways into the side of the hill to hold on for dear life. And as more of the soil erodes little by little by little over time, the tree roots are going to bury themselves more and more and more horizontally into the hill. Now, there's nothing wrong with the tree. There's nothing wrong with the roots. It's adapting to the situation. Here's another little story about trees in the spine. Let's say we take this image, right, our MRI, and uh, we look at it and we say, ooh, look, you know, protrusion, extrusion, and we say, ooh, that's bad, right? So that's a kind of a snapshot in time. Now, is that, has that bulge been there for a day, a month, a year, a decade? What I wanna say here is, you're taking a snapshot of the spine it doesn't automatically mean that it's progressive. And it doesn't mean that if the bulge gets larger and changes shape, that more damage and more symptomatology is guaranteed. Now, let's take that same snapshot and let's imagine we're taking a snapshot of a beautiful tree in the winter. So, What could we understand for certain about this picture of a tree in the winter? Uh, How do you know if it's alive or not, right? It doesn't have any leaves on it. So are we suspecting that it's dead or are we saying, well, maybe it's winter and it's lost its leaves? We can't know for sure, can we? And we certainly can't know, well, if the tree is alive, if it's going to produce leaves and flowers in the spring or even fruit. There's no way to know, but we can guess because we imagine that things are progressive. So I want to just backtrack and let's just make sure that we aren't scaring the patient with the picture. Here's something great that the uh, article says. Evaluation of patients with low back pain typically includes AP and lateral radiographs of the impacted area. Some physicians will obtain radiographs of the entire spine. So, you know, five stars for that. An MRI should not be ordered at the initial presentation of suspected acute disc herniations in patients lacking red flags because these patients will initially trial a six-week course of physical therapy and frequently improve. An MRI likely is an unnecessary financial and utilization burden in the initial presentation. Over time, both symptomatic and asymptomatic disc herniations will decrease in size on MRI. 
The finding of disc disease, either degeneration or herniation, on MRI does not correlate with the likelihood of chronic pain or the future need for surgery. Many patients are mistakenly led to the belief that the disorder can be cured by surgery. Sadly, failed surgeries and residual neurological deficits are common. For those who undergo surgery, the outcomes do vary from poor to fair. In fact, poor results are universal. And then the article says, Fortunately, the majority of patients will improve without surgical treatment. A course of at least six weeks of physical therapy with an emphasis on core strengthening and stretching should be attempted. The patient needs to understand that while surgical intervention has favorable outcomes for relieving radicular pain, the results are less predictable for non-radiating lower back pain. And then the article says, in regards to microdiscectomy postoperative rehabilitation, one study showed superior results when neuromuscular exercise programs were started two weeks post-surgery compared to those that were traditionally started at the six-week mark. Furthermore, at four to six weeks post-operatively, evidence shows that intensive exercise programs result in the more rapid short-term improvement of function as well as a return to work when compared to mild intensity programs. And then finally, the key is patient education. The nurse and the physical therapist are in a prime position to educate the patient about changes in lifestyle that can lead to significant improvement and a better quality of life. Weight loss must be encouraged the patient must enter an exercise program and eat a healthy diet. In the majority of patients with lumbar disc disease, a positive change in lifestyle leads to a marked improvement in symptoms. Just love this article. And I encourage you to read the whole article. It's not too extensive and it has some really great um, citations as well. Thank you for joining me today. Let's advocate for improved patient satisfaction and for the profession. Let's demonstrate a cross-culture willingness to strengthen medicine. Thank you.